Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first session of three, which will make up the ICIT fall briefing for 2021. My name is Parham Eftakari. Uh, usually we see you in person at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, this year we're doing things virtually, as most events are. Uh, looking forward to getting back together in person in the spring at our upcoming spring briefing. But we're really thrilled to have all of you here today uh, for our three-part event, uh, which is entitled Crossing the Digital Divide from Bits and Bytes to Reality. Now, these three sessions combined are designed to uh, offer guidance on how to integrate digital and physical cybersecurity strategies for both the public sector and the private sector. So we're really thrilled to have all of you here with us today for the first of our three-part series. I um, want to remind you that uh, the 23rd of this month, just next week, we have our next session called Securing the Perimeter with Greg Sisson, the CISO of DOE, Major Stephen Whitman, a research scientist from West Point, and Renata Spinks, the CTO at US Marine Corps. So we're very excited about that session as well. But uh, more importantly, we're here with three uh, fantastic experts to talk about uh, disruptions from the digital world, the impact of ransomware on critical infrastructures. I'm really thrilled to introduce uh, our three panelists today before I get started. Uh, and I also wanna first um, thank our co-chairs for this event, a DLT. DLT is one of our fellow program members. We do a tremendous number of thought leadership initiatives and educational initiatives, including briefings like this and research publications. So thanks to our friends at DLT uh, for making this possible. I'm gonna go ahead and start by introducing our panelists and then we'll get started. Uh, first, I'm, I'm the privilege of introducing Nitin Natarajan, the deputy director of CISA. Uh, Mr. Natarajan joined CISA as a deputy director in February of 2021. Prior to joining CISA, he served in numerous executive roles, including leading IT, cybersecurity, and homeland security missions. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Robert Wood, the CISO at CMS. Uh, as a CISO for CMS, uh, Mr. Wood has led the agency's cybersecurity, compliance, privacy, and counterintelligence initiatives. Prior to CMS, Mr. Wood has built and managed security programs in the private sector. And I have to say, I just did a webinar with Robert uh, earlier this morning, so it's good to see you uh, for a second time, Rob. <laughs> and uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, our ICIT fellow, James Carter. Uh, James is a um, VP uh, at Logarithm, uh, and uh, where he oversees the cybersecurity's risk, vulnerability, and governance strategies. He also oversees Logarithm's lab research on threat and compliance issues. Uh, as, as you all know, ICIT is a nonprofit think tank. We rely on our fellows to contribute to uh, opportunities such as this. So James, it's good to see you and have you back. So um, guys, we're gonna go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, obviously we're gonna talk about ransomware. Everyone's talking about ransomware these days. Um, one of the stats that I was given uh, as prep material said that there's been 151% year over year increase in ransomware attacks. I read things that are sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but the bottom line is we know that ransomware is highly prevalent and it's becoming a more and more disruptive force to uh, our society uh, at all levels. Um, some notable, notable attacks that I think we'll be talking about, just a level set with the audience, uh, that really not only have a, a logical component, but really a kinetic and physical component include the, a new operative, uh, the attack on new operative, which shut down animal feeding systems, uh, the San Andreas Regional Center healthcare provider attack, which caused all sort of chaos in a healthcare environment. Of course, we have Colonial Pipeline, which led to fuel shortages and price, pricing spikes and, and a lot of just hysteria in that part of the country. Uh, and uh, recently uh, in, in the DC area, we had Howard University that experienced attack, which led to all sorts of uh, disruptions in an educational setting. Um, so uh, of course, you know, we know that there's many, many more to talk about. I think a really interesting place to start here would be to ask the group to comment on um, what types of ransomware attack scenarios most concern you uh, and, and with, with respect to the type of consequence they can have in the physical world. I think a lot of the times we talk about just um, shutting down an organization and the organization loses money, which is of course important, but I think there's more and more uh, uh, kinetic outcomes to cyber uh, and ransomware attacks as well. So I'd open it up to the group just to share what are some of the scenarios that really concern you and that you talk among uh, in your circles? Yeah, I, I can kick us off. Um, so. I mean, I think you can pretty easily look across the the critical sectors and and sort of start picking out scenarios that would be concerning if if an organization involved heavily involved in a critical sector or supporting a region, for example. Like I'll use uh, since I'm at CMS, I'll use a, a hospital, for example. 
if you had a major hospital network operating in a region and there were ransomware that affected devices um, that affected a, a hospital's network and, and sort of like put them into a place where they could not accept new patients, where they had to do like major redirects, things like that. Like that would be tremendously disruptive. And obviously there's there's the potential for loss of life um, uh, or, or just other severe health uh, uh, ramifications in that. So that concerns me um, because the it, it, the the sort of scenario planning that goes into uh, like ransomware prep is is oftentimes very focused on like an organization's contingency planning or an organization maintaining operations and and not necessarily the stakeholders or customers or consumers of the organization's operations. So like in in you know patients in the case of a hospital. So. Um, yeah, I mean, all of the all of the main critical critical sectors uh, uh, make me nervous, and of course, it would depend on like what I'm doing at any given point in time that would uh, you know make me make me more more nervous. Yeah, I think like Robert, I've got a bit of a healthcare background. They don't uh, like me mentioning uh, that as healthcare is very sensitive with it, but uh, it, we'll just say it's in the, the southeast part of Minnesota, and it's very pronounced, uh, very renowned healthcare organization. So. <laughs> Um, but, but obviously, I tend to think in a little bit of a morbid way when it comes to physical uh, impacts and similarly, you know, human life, you know, you have, you know, medical devices that are life sustaining uh, for patients. And if those get locked up, that person goes away. Uh, you can't treat patients. You can't, you don't know their allergies or their symptoms or, or their medications if their electronic health records have been compromised. Um, you don't know. Um, you know, at the end of the day, hospitals are trying to save lives and uh, the integrity of their ability to do so is at risk with ransomware. But then you go even beyond that. And the other things I'm afraid of is, is a lot of like, you know, kind of can bucket it both in physical, but also in psychological aspects of things. But, you know, water treatment facilities, we had the one in, I think it was Ford or whatever, they got compromised. And at the end of the day, you know, there are mechanisms within that operation where you can you know, lower certain levels of chemicals in the water, raise certain levels of chemicals, and ultimately you could poison the water and that could be lead to wide scale issues across there. Blackouts with power production, you know, if I can shut down the operations of a dam with ransomware, uh, does that does that start causing blackouts and am I limiting the the power that's that's being put on the onto the grid? Um, and then obviously, you know, you even have things that were like not really ransomware, but things like Stuxnet that obviously halted the production of uh, manufacturing of nuclear uh, nuclear weapons or, you know, farming and production, food production. And so like heaven forbid there's a shortage of butter or milk or yogurt and cheese uh, or even more. What if you shut down the, uh, the wineries and distilleries and breweries? We would all be uh, buying very expensive beer, wine and alcohol uh, that we would need. Uh, as a part of responding to any ransomware incident we're a part of anyway. So those are all the things that, that really trouble me as it relates to ransomware. And it really, you know, the, my thing is that I like to say is it turns your grandmother into, it can turn your grandmother into a hardened cyber criminal because you can get it so easily. You can, it's effective. It does a great job, uh, you know, relatively speaking. Uh, and uh, it, there's not a whole lot of expertise needed to, to really take advantage of it, but the impact and potential impact is massive. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I so I, uh, James, I'm like, or similar, I, I was a hospital administrator in a former life, so I don't like to uh, reminisce about the old days, but, you know, you look at the risks that are there, you look at a lot of what we were talking about on, on the bedside and the potential impacts there. I think that, you know, we talk about going back to paper and there is only a certain amount of paper you can go back to, right? I think as we've looked at the transformation and the inclusion of technology so much in what we do day to day, I was at the, you know, I was a clinician during a time when we were transitioning into things like electronic PIXA systems and things like that for medication control and, and electronic health records. But, you know, during those transition times, I think, and th this is comparable to every sector, right? This is not just a healthcare uh, reference, but, you know, in every sector, we had that period of time when technology, we still had one foot in, one foot out of the automated systems, technology and building control systems, like all these types of things that we've seen. We're well beyond that, right? We've now kind of gone into this electronic era where we are, we have backups, but how effective are the backups? Do we maintain the same quality with the backups, the same throughput with the backups, the same capability and capacity we have with the backups? And I'm not sure that's there. And as we look across all the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, and we look at a lot of the, the challenges that they all have, we can revert back to 
you know, non-electronic means in many cases, but what impact does that alone have, right? And because often those backups are not at the same level of what people are used to seeing day in and day out. I think as, as, you know, as Robert mentioned, there's the monetary impact as we look at ransomware, there's, you know, the X, you know, X fill of information, intelligence, corporate information, espionage, you know, IP, all that kind of stuff. There's also the public trust aspect, right? What what risks do we have of various companies, industries, sectors, and the public's confidence in their ability to execute? Now, I think in some sectors, you don't have a choice, right? I, I mean, you, you look at water, right? You open the tap, water comes out, and you don't necessarily choose your water provider, right? So you, there there is a certain trust there that we need to you know build and sustain, you know. And then I think for sectors that have a choice in provider, right? Whether you look at uh, the financial sector, or you look at others. You know, how are we making sure that that um, that we're able to maintain that trust and maintain that confidence in that entity's ability to continue to provide service? And then, what are the impacts if that trust is lost? You know, by, by the end user uh, within that sector. And I think in some sectors it can be very significant. Um, you know, and and how do we best mitigate against that or prepare against that? Or even, even I'll, I'll add, you know, public trust is, is something that's very important to me as it relates to this, just because, you know, nation states, A, have been using ransomware for a while, and they do use them in nation state threat actor attacks, not just cyber criminal attacks, uh, but B, the whole psychological warfare, psychological operations that every country takes against the other country, you know, is all about undermining the trust in the government and our ability to protect our citizens. And so, you know, whether it be the water treatment facility or, or whatever, now you start getting this, this, or, or if the power grid goes out for a period of time, right? Now, you, now you, and it's a ransomware attack. Now you start getting panic and hysteria and people that are, aren't trusting the government and their ability to protect us. Uh, and so I think that public trust factor can't be undermined. That's why, even though this is about the sort of physical side of ransomware, I think there's, you know, I would classify psychological as just as a big and important uh, aspect of it. Did we, did we lose our moderator? We might have. <laughs> Just for a moment, his uh, connection dropped. So with that, let me actually kind of push on the idea of the goodwill a little bit. What about other areas that we see ransomware impacting our, our overarching organ, um, nation? So things like, are there GDP implications? Do we see ransomware being used to leverage supply chain disruptions? Have you guys seen anything like that? I mean, yeah, I mean, just look at the, the meatpacking uh, organization, the Colonial Pipeline, you know, there is there is revenue, downstream revenue that was uh, halted for a period of time. Uh, and so just like a company that say you're in healthcare and you're, you're a victim of a ransomware attack, guess what? Your operation stops for a period of time and therefore that's revenue every minute of every hour uh, not being generated that, that if you're out. And so the same thing happens or the ability for, hey, guess what? The meat packing facility here locally in Colorado, uh, Coors uh, was hit by, by a ransomware attack. And guess what? People didn't go into the office or they didn't show up to work. And so now you're, now you're taking money out of, out of pockets of people uh, that, that get infused into our GDP as a country. And so there is, there is a lot of downstream impacts related to that that people just don't think about because they're in their silo of like, it's just my company. It's just my revenue loss, but there's a huge downstream impact for suppliers, uh, especially if you're a supplier for other industries or things like that. They're going to have outages and shortages now. That's going to impact GDP. And then that ultimately goes back to the, the country's GDP as well. And so there's there's wide scale impact that people just have a hard time thinking about as it relates to this. Yeah, I think it's really dependent on the like on the industry and on the the organization, because not everyone is a supplier. Some, uh, you know, or or like the supplier of, like who the supplier consumer um, and dependency relationships are, they differ so significantly from organization to organization to industry to industry. Um, you know, I mean, we kind of we kind of see this in some ways. It's not ransomware, but you know, whenever AWS has an outage, like everything shuts down and you're like oh you know why why isn't github working why isn't slack working why isn't this working why isn't that working and and then it like all ties back to oh everyone's running on aws and they had a they had a blip 
um, for example, like that's why. And so it like underscores these, uh, you know, underscores these cross cutting dependencies that we that we have as you know as, as society. And that's like that's interesting as far as like trust goes. I'm not sure that ransomware or any any like IT disruption would necessarily um, have a have an impact on um, on on like brand trust. Uh, like I don't I don't you know maybe I'm maybe I'm totally wrong, but the the idea of in of a of a consumer sort of looking at like uh, um, I think it was James or or maybe uh, Nitin made the uh, the reference to like turning on the water and it just comes out and like there's this there's this trust like just because maybe your supplier got hit like a lot of times there's not really choice like you don't get to really choose what deli meats in your in your stores or you know who supplies your water like in some cases you do but oftentimes you know there's a lot of that stuff that's just taken for granted like there's disruption but there's not consumer choice that would influence like you know, selection of one provider over another. Like some cases, you know, you might shop at you know Walmart versus Target if if something happens. But I I I don't really see um, I don't really see that being that big of a thing, especially since like even after big brand breaches, you know, not ransomware but breaches, you know, like the stock market like it'll blip and then it'll it'll sort of normalize right after. So it's like you know, was behavior actually changed? Um, and if behavior wasn't changed, then that to me means that trust probably wasn't, you know, didn't take that big a hit. All right, guys, um, I'm sorry about that. I think you can see me and hear me now, is that correct? We can hear you, <laughs> we can hear you. I'm not that, not that prettier to look at. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry about that, let me, let's jump back in and, and I apologize, I hope this doesn't, uh, uh, Get us off track and what we're talking about here because i missed a minute or two but um uh, i think robert you know dovetailing off what you said and then going back to a question i had before i got cut off um what do you think are some of the um factors that are creating this environment that are making these attacks and these outcomes possible and and, and do you expect this to increase or decrease is this being driven by what organizations are doing is it the vendor, you know, the suppliers of these technologies, what's really driving all, is, is it just that hackers are getting better? What's what's driving all of this? I don't think the hackers are getting better at all. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, other than being more organized uh, and, uh, you know, things that, that, you know, I've seen a lot with nation state threat actors in my past career. Um, but I mean, you look at it, it's security investment or lack thereof, uh, high impact, whatever organization downstream or upstream has impact to uh, money to pay for it. As long as those things exist in your organization, you're going to be a really ripe target for a you know ransomware criminal group or whatever the case might be. Uh, and then when, when, you, when you when you break that down, it's really about like you know their level of preparedness, their level of knowledge around it, their readiness around it. Uh, I can deep dive into any of those uh, uh, specifics. But you know, based on all of those factors, uh, I don't think that companies are going to be able to get better fast enough to slow this trend down. And I actually think it will continue to rise, especially as we start combining some of the psychological, physical stuff into things. And and you know, just as an example, you know, when, when COVID and the pandemic first happened, guess what? There was also a spike in ransomware then too. People trying to disguise themselves as whether it's something related to the pandemic, whether it's the uh, vaccine or, you know, different sources of information or whatever the case is. So I think as long as there's like worldly impactful events and, and you're an organization that has a lack of investment security, high impact to, to something uh, and the funds to pay for it, this is just going to continue to rise. Because even the executive orders that have been coming out uh, to better secure our critical infrastructure, uh, that takes time and money and everything else to basically get ahead of, and, and it's usually a slow process. And so uh, I, I think maybe five years from now, we can come back and revisit this conversation and say, okay, now is the time when it's starting to slow down because we're getting better, but we don't know where the attacker is going to be at that point in time. So I, I, don't, I don't see it slowing down. Yeah, I mean, I think that as we look at it, how, how do we make it, we'll never eliminate completely, right? So how do we make it harder for the adversary to attack? How do we make it less financially 
um, beneficial to the adversary to conduct the attacks and those types of things as, as we look at this. And to me, a lot of it comes down to risk, right? I think we we spend a lot of time talking about risk identification in our organizations, both physical and cyber risk. We spend a good amount of time talking about risk mitigation. I think we forget the third leg of that stool, which is risk acceptance. And I think that we don't, at, at the CEO and at the board level, right? So I think I think these discussions happen at the CISO level, at the you know, chief security officer level, but truly at the at the CEO at the at, and the board level, have folks truly understood the risk that they are accepting in their organization, recognizing we'll never mitigate all risk, right? There's like if there were a magic bubble, we'd buy the magic bubble and we'd be good, right? It just doesn't exist. So, you know, in lieu of that, do we truly understand the risk that we're accepting, and are we mitigating that risk effectively? You know, are we truly mitigating the risk effectively? Um, and are we asking the right questions to, to, to understand what's out there? So I think that it is going to be an interesting upcoming year is it, from the perspective of, you know, frequency of attacks, complexity of attacks. But how do we better position ourselves to make, just make it harder for the adversary as we go forward? And a lot of that to me is having is ensuring that those that are at the end of the day responsible for risk to the respective organizations, whether public or private sector, right, not just one or the other, you know, are truly understanding the risk that's being accepted within their organization based upon the mitigation measures um, that they've put in place. And I'm not convinced, in at least the conversations I've had with folks throughout the nation, that that investment of time and resources has really happened yet. It's happening more and more, I think, but it's still not, um, you know, systemic enough to really understand uh, how we're be how, how what additional things we can do to help mitigate some of this uh, to lessen the impacts of these attacks as we go forward. And then there's one quick solution to some of that is to have the CISO report into the CEO and the board. Um, I think that's that's something that's a still fairly rare in our industry today, but that gets them into that executive leadership team, into those uh, conversations around risk uh, and being able to you know, articulate that in a way so that way people can make educated uh, and informed uh, decisions on risk acceptance or not. Uh, and so that's that's just a really quick, easy way to do it. Yeah, I think we've started to see more of that, but definitely not to the levels that, you know, we need to get to to see the broad change. You know, we, yeah, um, I, I don't know oh. that I fully, fully buy that. I mean, it's it like it elevates the position in a way, but but at the same time, it like you still you still need as a as a CISO to be able to articulate things through the language of those you're trying to communicate with. Like, you know, I think I think there's a there's a really pervasive tendency to um you know in 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 our field to expect other people to sort of meet us where we're at communication wise. And we we neglect to remember that like communication is not about what we're saying, it's about what people are hearing and what people take away. And regardless of where you report, the like it's it's really to me about like how we frame information. Like we could we could talk about technical risks all day long. We could talk about patches. We could talk about um, you know this scenario, that scenario. But if we're not framing things in a you know in a in a like a language that our intended audience wants to hear it, and and like doing the hard work of um, of communicating that effectively, then like no matter where we report, it's gonna struggle. And I think even if you do have that reporting relationship, like if you're not doing the hard work of communicating effectively, then you're gonna be no better off as, uh, you know, if, if you're like reporting like five layers down from the CEO. So it, like it does change some of the, like the culture dynamics, but I don't think that's an easy win. Yeah, no, and, I, I, agree. I will say that. I'll say that reporting to uh, folks other than the CEO is is workable, but just like what you said, whether or not you're at the CEO level or below, you still got to be able to communicate that in the language of the CEO, executive leadership team, and board, so that way that way they understand it. And and I can tell you by reporting uh, as a CISO that doesn't report to the CEO uh, to a CISO that does report to the CEO now. There's a lot of business aspects of conversations that I get involved in now that, that maybe I just, you know, didn't get it passed down to me whenever I was not reporting to the CEO. So I think it makes a big difference. Um, is it workable in other, in other ways? Sure. Uh, it just makes it a little bit less friction involved as it relates to that. And you have to be a little bit less, um, uh, you, you, you just, it just makes it a lot easier.
Excuse me. Yeah, I agree, and, and I should have mentioned this on the on the onset. Robert uh, had a uh, a conflict came up today last minute, so he uh, he had to duck out early. So thanks to him for his contributions. I want to dove, dovetail on what we're talking about. Um, uh, one of my my other uh, organizations that I'm involved with is actually a, a CISO collaborative for primarily uh, uh, commercial sector CISOs, and we have a, a lot of discussion about just this particular point, uh, where the CISO sits in the organization and how to effectively engage the business leaders and the board. And so much of it comes to, there, there's two things that we often talk about, and we have a lot of uh, Fortune 500 CISOs that are, that are involved in what we do. And there's, a lot of it comes down to, you know, what's the, you have to map the incentive of who you're speaking with, like how are, what's, what's, what, what keeps them up at night and what's incentivizing them, both, both uh, emotionally, but also frankly, financially, right? I know government doesn't have those same constructs, but for, in the private sector, that, that that's works. And so if you, not only speak in their language, but think about what incentivizes them and speak in those terms to be even more precision targeted and trying to effectively advocate for what it is you're looking for. The next time around, uh, when you go to make an ask or, or ask for some sort of a, a governance change or policy change, there, there seems to be a lot more um, willingness to listen and actually implement and support the CISO or the security lead. So I think it, it's such a complex but important issue um, I, I um, Mr. Director Natarajan, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, you'd mentioned that um, not, uh, you think from your perspective, there maybe could be more could be done um, uh, right now. What is, I know that CISA in particular is doing a lot of work around this very topic, right? Engaging with critical infrastructure sectors and um, launching programs like ransomware.gov and, and other things. Do you want to maybe you know, use this, let's use this as an opportunity maybe to talk about some of the specific work that CISA is doing to uh, affect this type of change and engage um, both with the security community, but also with the kind of business community out there to to solve some of the problems we're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, I think I'll, um, a few of the items, I mean, you mentioned stop ransomware.gov, which I think is great, you know, giving people kind of a one-stop shop for that information. We work closely with our colleagues at HHS. Uh, you know, uh, on that as well as the FBI and others to to really kind of help. How do we get that information out there to folks? And to me, again, it's kind of on that multi-tiered level, right? It's how do we get technical information out to the to the technical teams? How do we get more policy, strategic information out to um, you know CEOs, uh, senior elected officials, those types of things, and really get people to understand the threat landscape of what we're seeing right now in ransomware. How do we effective more? How do we have more effective information sharing? How do we know when attacks have occurred? How do we know that we're able to share IOCs and other kind of technical data so we can work together, kind of in a trusted environment, to work to protect our colleagues across other sectors or even within that sector? Uh, it's really kind of pushing on on multiple fronts so that we're able to kind of again kind of strengthen that resilience nationally. I think a lot of it to me comes down to information sharing, both pre-incident as well as post-incident, and how do we streamline those mechanisms uh, to do that more effectively. How do we take the time to build the trust that we need to, right? Not, I know it's no surprise to everyone, you know, government isn't always the trusted entity that people want to go to, um, you know, when it comes to things. And so how do we build that trust that, you know, we're, we're looking for um, to do this in a collaborative way? Uh, you know, in a former life, I actually worked in HHS and, you know, I was trying to sell cybersecurity to the private sector, you know, you know work with us at HHS and, and let's do this. And I, I've been thrilled to watch from the sidelines and, and watch how far it's come. It's, it's you know amazing work by the team over there at HHS because one of the biggest hurdles we had to get over was you're a regulator. So I don't want to give you the information because you're going to use it for other means. And my office was not a regulator. Like there were parts of HHS that regulated, it wasn't us. Um, but there's this perception, right? That if it goes to the government, that it's only it's going to be used for alternative motive, um, which was not our intent. Our intent was to, to strengthen, you know, that the, uh, you know, the preparedness and, and of, of systems across the nation and healthcare facilities and, and other partners across the healthcare sector. And, you know, I think we've, we've come a long way, HHS has come a long way in kind of building a lot of that trust and how do we continue to do that? I think when it comes to things like ransomware, that we can be that trusted dialogue both before an incident as well as as an incident occurs, um, you know, with our partners. I mean, we have a lot of efforts along those lines to, to do that in collaboration with others. So strengthening information sharing, uh, across all levels, strengthening those partnerships, there are it's a response capabilities, uh, looking at things like the JCDC, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, and how do we work more closely with the private sector and understanding what they're seeing, what we're seeing, how do we put a lot of that information together in this kind of cell that, again, can collectively go out and help others. So a lot of efforts along uh, those lines to 
again, the kind of strength of the ecosystem, right? It's, collab it, it, it's collective defense at the end of the day, right? It's not about what did CISA do or what did one company do or what, what did one organization do? It's that collective defense, not just domestically, even internationally. Um, so, you know, I had a discussion this morning here with our colleagues from Singapore, talking about ransomware. You know, how do we collectively work, not just within the United States, but with our international colleagues to strengthen our efforts? Because again, if you're attacking one, you're most likely attacking all. So how do we, how do we work together to strengthen that defense uh, globally as well? Thanks, those, those are um, all great initiatives. And, and I must say, um, we just recently had uh, one of the CISA uh, executives uh, do a briefing with about maybe 20 Fortune 500 CISOs uh, that are part of the Cybersecurity Collaborative, that the other organization I mentioned, and it was it was so, so valuable. And um, we had so many of them really leaning in and asking for um, uh, specific uh, activities that they can get involved in to drive forward the outcomes that, that we're all talking about. And, I, and, I, and it really, uh, you know, these days we do so many of these Zoom conferences, but end of the day, it just takes a lot of these conversations, getting in front of the right person and, and just start to build that trust and build those relationships. Uh, James and, and Rob, to, to, from your perspectives, what are some other things that organizations, um, that the leaders within organizations should be doing to create cultures that uh, support um, uh, you know, better security to defend against ransomware or, or whatnot. I know we talked about one aspect of which is where the CISO reports to and how the CISO reports, but are there other things that you've seen or you've experienced or you think that organizations should be doing that maybe they're not right now? Yeah, so so one thing that comes to mind for me, and, uh, uh, oh, sorry, James. Um, uh, and then, unfortunately, I'm going to have to drop in uh, a couple of minutes for uh, another conflict, but the... Um, is I'm a big fan of security trying to intentionally reduce the cognitive load that it places on other teams. So, you know, we have this, we also have this tendency to kind of, you know, if you see something, say something, you know, make sure you screen all your emails this way, um, yeah, that kind of thing. And we expect this kind of like constant vigilance, which is hard, right? Like people don't get paid to, uh, you know, to be secure, not everyone is paid to be a security professional. Like we're paid to be security professionals, not everyone else is, they've got other jobs to do. And and so I think it's like, we need to take on some amount of burden as as leaders in organizations to like to identify, let's say, let's say you're, you're the biggest vector for ransomware delivery is uh, email-based attachments, for example. Um, you know, expecting everyone to to have a really good awareness of how to identify potential spear phishing or even just regular dragnet phishing, um, how to identify malicious versus non-malicious attachments, how to identify uh, a, a, a malicious sender, all of that stuff, like that that can get very complicated very quickly, especially if you start taking into consideration, you know, email spoofing and maybe compromised accounts or, um, you know, like typo squatting and, and all of that. And so, um, so I'm a big fan of, of leading teams through exercises of like, like going through these, these common scenarios or these high, high uh, likelihood scenarios or, or, or pathways in the form of like attack and defense trees. And so if you can start to systematically find ways to say, hey, user, you don't have to like, like we're, we're not going to be expecting you to have to think about that so deeply because um, we're going to put in place other like process or technical controls to try to alleviate that mental burden for you. Um, and that way you can kind of funnel and focus the things they do have to actively think about. You can make your training more focused. And, and not, none of this is perfect, obviously, but, but expecting users to have this like constant vigilance in this boil the ocean approach, I think does us a disservice. And so, um, so I'm a big fan of that as far as like, and, and I think like that mindset permeates across a lot of things that security can and should do across a culture. So, um, and I think doing that, being intentional about that and transparent about that inside your organizations creates this, this mutual trust between end users and security that like, hey, they're not just here to beat up on us. Like they actually, they wanna do things safely or they wanna make our job, make us like help us do our jobs safely. And, and they're not just here to kind of like breathe down our necks and, and make us feel bad about ourselves. So. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm a big proponent of, of that sort of, that sort of thinking. And, and Robert, I, I'd agree with you on, on a lot of that. I mean, oftentimes security can be a little, little hard 
and uh, it's our yep. job to make it easier and frictionless for them to be secure, but also relate to the fact of, you know, how, how can security make their lives easier outside of just being secure, right? Like, if I can talk to my development team and we could talk about, uh, the you know, code and defects and how they track those rates and how security can impact that or release timing, but like really relate to what's important to each of the stakeholders, uh, what's, uh, what's highly impactful for them, uh, how we're going to make their lives easier. Um, and it just so happens we're also making it more secure, but by having it be about as frictionless and easy as possible versus making it hard on everybody to be secure. I think, I think that's, that's another aspect. And then when you look at, you know, just ransomware, uh, in general, um, you know, I'll tell you right now, uh, my executive team, that's like one of the biggest fears that they have. And so, you know, we show the level of preparedness. We show that we've run through exercises. Uh, we've got the technology in place. Um, you know, you'd be surprised at what you hear from ransomware victims about what they had for their antivirus product or EDR product. It was like, oh, we were using this open source thing or free version of this or some old signature based stuff. Uh, and I said, okay, what'd you do to, what'd you do to fix it? Oh, we deployed. CrowdStrike Sentinel One or Carbon Black or something like that. It's like, oh, that that was it. And they're like, yes. It's like, okay, well, well, well great. Uh, and so maybe they have some managed services on top of it. But at the end of the day, it's just like keep your technology infrastructure up to date. Uh, keep it sort of modern. Uh, and and obviously, I know small medium business. It's hard to invest that kind of money. But if so, if, if, if that's the situation that you're in. Um, you know, buy some some of some some managed services, buy some you know kind of core fundamental technologies that that can help you with that. But for us, we we have all that. We demonstrate all that. We run through exercises. Uh, we have crisis comms. We have all these different things. And I, I'll tell you, it makes our board and our exec team feel a whole lot better about ransomware uh, than what they're reading on the news. And I think that's an important thing too of, of security is giving some reassurances as well whenever it's appropriate. Um, and, uh, and I think all those things are, are, are beneficial at, uh, at all levels of the organization. Yeah, those, those are all excellent uh, ideas and, and recommendations. They're just, uh, we could spend a whole hour just talking about what organizations, you know, can and should be doing, but those are all, those are all excellent. I, I think, uh, in listening all three of you speak, uh, you know, the importance of engaging different stakeholders, uh, you know, we already, we've talked about the, the board and the CEO, but engaging HR and legal and finance and business unit leads, uh, I think is also just a, you know, such a critical component to, again, continuing to drive these outcomes. I think um, uh, uh, you, you, you used the word trust a few times. I mean, it just goes down to building these trusted relationships and the more we can uh, you know, demystify what it is that we're doing and show that this is actually, it's not a cost center. It's not, as Robert was saying, something to get in the way, but it's actually a business enabler and it's a good strategy for your organization. I think the more we'll continue to get that, that buy-in across the organization. Um, switching gears a little bit, I know we, we kind of uh, already talked about um, you know, the consequences of uh, ransomware uh, outside of uh, the, the impact of the organization and, and are, are, are bad actors using ransomware for um, other, other um, outcomes, be it supply chain issues or, or, or gaining economic advantage or just causing disruption. Um, I, I wanted to kind of ask a question about um, different sectors uh, and those who are highly regulated th th versus those who are you know not as regulated. Um, there's kind of conversation out there right now that um, maybe more policy is needed, more uh, legislation is needed, more regulation is needed, particularly in some of these uh, sectors uh, where uh, uh, attacks could have a larger societal uh, uh, outcome, uh, and particularly. You know, we were before I got cut off. I was actually going to comment that hearing you all talk, uh, my very first question about different scenarios. We're a think tank, and so we do a lot of just research and scenario building, and we don't like them fear monger at all. But one of the things that we've oft, often written about is what if a well uh, resourced, you know, adversary like a nation state was to simultaneously launch a bunch of attacks, you know, and what that would look like, and especially if that was around elections time or you know in, in, a, in, a, in a swing district or in a swing state I mean these scenarios start to get quite frightening and going back to the kind of the kinetic outcome uh, I guess my question here is what are your thoughts on the best way to appropriately regulate and legislate in the role of federal government versus the role of the, the, the organization and the private sector itself 
to, uh, again, kind of start to reduce this risk. I'll let Nitin start since he's uh, more on the regulation <laughs> side than I am, but I'm happy to jump in on that too. No, I think, I mean, listen, I think what we want to get a sense of is, is what is the best way to go about achieving the end success, right? So, I mean, to, to me, the answer is not to regulate everything. It's also not to regulate nothing, right? So I think that there's, it's, it's looking across the sectors. There's already existing amount of regulation out there, right, that the sectors are, are, are having in play. Elements of the sector, so we talk about our, our colleague on that, you know, we go back to kind of the healthcare side of the house. There's aspects of healthcare that are very highly regulated. There's aspects of healthcare that are less regulated, right? So, you know, really looking at at where are the gaps and then how best do we fill those gaps through, you know, the right mechanisms, whether that's, you know, voluntary programs, whether that's, you know, collaboration, whether that's existing partnerships, whether that's that's regs. I mean, I think there, there's, I don't want to look at, there's no single solution to this problem, right? It's not that if we wrote, if, if we got support and wrote a magic regulation, right, that we would solve all of this. Um, so to me, it, it's not really that switch kind of, 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 you know, reg or not reg. It's, it's, um, it's not even a dimmer cause I don't, that's why I'm probably not right analogy going in the right direction, but anyway, it's, it's more like having a lot, you know, what, what's the right, so what's the right tool for this? And I think it really, it's going to vary, not just even by sector within a sector, what is the best way to go about it? Where are the gaps? Industry is taking a lot on themselves, right? You look at a lot of the industries, even those that are not highly regulated, where there's a quantifiable ROI, right? When you, they can they can point specifically to, you know, either either impact on on corporate branding, on on P and L, right? If there if there's a direct linkage to an outcome that impacts the company from the cyber attack, you're going to see higher investment than in organizations where you really can't, or right, or where it's not as visible uh, that's out there. So I think that you know what we're looking at is, is what is the best solution for each element of each sector. Um, you know, as opposed to, you know, reg or not reg. And I think, it, and I don't say that like skate away. It's just, I think it's a, it's a very complicated issue. And the answer isn't to, you know, to be overbearing and cause more, more challenge or more issues. Uh, we want to support the sectors to be successful. And some of that we may be able to do just through, you know, getting people to understand the threat effectively, right? Maybe the issue isn't, we have to come out with a, a massive reg. Maybe the issue is we just need to get people to understand what the risk is, understand the risk they're accepting and the steps that they can take to mitigate against that. In other areas, reg may be the answer. I think we want to look at that effectively and see which tool we want to use as we go forward. Because uh, we're hearing a lot is being done by a lot of sectors out there, right? We don't want to be dismissive of the hard work that's gone in, the investment that's uh, that's gone in by both private sector as well as state, local, tribal, territorial governments today. Yeah, I, I think, you know, just to piggyback on that, you know, ahead of regulation, uh, just because, A, not all regulation uh, addresses cybersecurity and, and it addresses them in so many different ways, but getting hit in the wallet is, is, is the clearest and most direct way to get someone's attention and, and help get the proper investment in this area. When we were dealing with social engineering compromises and things like that, and these high level executives have like, oh, you know, we had, you know, my paycheck for the past six months redirected the direct deposit to another bank. Guess what? That hit them right in the wallet. So they they got really strong religion around cybersecurity uh, as it relates to that. And so I think companies deal with the same way. The other, the other part too is I, I hit on it earlier, which is not all regulation is the same. You know, healthcare is a good example. If you look at the HIPAA regs or maybe even high trust, uh, sometimes you look at it and like, first of all, do you even understand security uh, as a part of this? Uh, or you wanna push something that's, you know, decades behind the times, or you don't wanna to touch certain certain areas of cybersecurity. And so I think, I, I think we can't rely on those types of regulations that include some aspect of cybersecurity in that to be the governing force. I do think there needs to be a cybersecurity framework. Some people use NIST and some of these other ones, but there needs to be something that reg that that sort of governs and regulates all critical infrastructure. So that way, we're not low hanging fruit. Um, and, you know, we're doing the basic IT hygiene, basic security hygiene. We're doing certain things to make it at least a little tougher barrier to entry to compromise us with something like ransomware. As, as I mentioned before, uh, there are so many companies, and I will say the few of them that I've dealt with directly are in the government or uh, you know sector or SLED or Fed or things like that, where they're running something that just just wasn't modern, and and therefore they got they became victim of it. So just like doing the things to keep your infrastructure modern, keeping 
basic IT and security hygiene in place, I think is a is it's like food, water, shelter, and that uh, as it relates to your basic needs, uh, especially as it relates to ransomware. Yeah, I mean, it, it's shocking how many folks aren't patching, right? How many folks aren't, as you said, James, update, updating software? Like, it, it's just it's mind boggling at times, right? And but I think there's some, and some of it is cost. Some of it is you know it's not cheap, right? Not from an investment perspective, especially for small businesses. But I think at the same time, it, is there the awareness on the criticality of these simple steps, right? I, I kind of jokingly tell people, you know, something as simple as like not taping your password underneath your keyboard is a huge step forward, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's as ludicrous as that sounds, that's a step forward. Things like multi-factor authentication is, you know, is a huge step forward. And so even a lot of the, the those fundamental things that we think are baked into what everybody is doing, isn't and so how do we you know a lot of our messaging a lot of what we're trying to get out there is go back to the basics look at the fundamentals and like let, let's you know make sure we're doing those things as we look you know more forward and into more advanced capabilities and, and technologies as well yeah it's, it's funny i was i was employee 53 uh at mandiant um pre-fire i i uh, i left a few weeks before the fire eye acquisition became official but i used to tell customers one the best way to get cybersecurity budget is to have a breach, period. Second thing is, um, um, now I just lost my, lost my train of thought, but the, the second thing was uh, I never saw a company that did really good IT hygiene and security hygiene get compromised and be involved in a breach. Like most of the customers uh, that I had there, and then I was involved in about 160 different intrusion investigations, most of them were for were bad, borderline negligent in some of those areas. And I think if we could just raise that game even a little bit, like you said, make make some, you know, something like not taping your password or implementing MFA. MFA saves your bacon more than anything else that I can think of right now. And and the fact that we still have organizations out there that, that are enabling that, uh, it's it is mind boggling. But I think if we can just if we can use regulation to just raise the bar even incrementally across all the sectors. It will be a huge win and, and we'll have a lot less victims or at least we'll make it really hard harder or we'll make it at least um, a, a little more challenging and more time involved in compromising organization versus how easy it is today yeah, yeah you know um one of the things that of course the new administration has recently done uh, back in may is released the uh, executive order around cybersecurity for federal agencies with focused on zero trust among other issues um, and I think a lot of it goes back to some of these basic cyber hygiene concepts. I, I, I'm curious, just just as an aside, um, what is your perception on the uh, executive order? I, I think it's uh, I actually had the the webinar I did with Robert earlier this morning was on the executive order. So uh, you know, it, it obviously it's been lauded, a, a tremendous amount of value in there. And we had a great discussion earlier about how agencies are actually implementing the executive order. So I, I'd like to hear from your perspectives. Um, you know how you see that process going, and 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 um, um, how you prioritize the various aspects in the EO for agencies that that maybe trying to figure out how to how to um, uh, operationalize the guidance. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know the EO was extremely helpful in putting a spotlight on this, right? I think very early on in the administration, you know, from the top down, that that cybersecurity is going to be important as we look at this going forward. How do we protect like, our focus on the federal civilian executive branch, right? Kind of the non DoD, non Intel community focus, um, and what do we do to, to strengthen those efforts? I think the timelines were extremely aggressive. You know, I, I always refer. There was one deadline that was 14 days in, which you know anyone who's worked with government knows 14 days is, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> is is uh what it takes to you know to, to find the restroom right so it's you know we had some very aggressive timelines we still have aggressive timelines as we go forward and i think you know i think that's good i think it helps push us as we go forward i think part of the challenge also is that it it, it it's helping departments that have distributed systems and capabilities networks to even not just bring together i think federal government organizations, departments at the departmental level within departments that's bringing them together and so you know robert's at cms right within hhs you know cms nih cdc you know they're all independent entities and while they may report up to a cio and a cso you know how, you know I, I every departmental cio and cso i've i've talked to is wish they had a little bit more you know ability to kind of wrangle the, the the folks within their respective organizations i think the eo helps bring a lot of that together it helps us give a kind of a common goal and i think the other benefit is a lot of the outputs of what's coming out of the eo can be used more broadly 
right, can be used not just by the federal government, but by other partners. Um, when we publish the reports, we, ha we have a lot of the, the outputs that are pu more public facing. People are going to have an opportunity to take what we have done and adapt, utilize, you know, provide feedback right in, into how we continue to move better uh, as a as a nation in this space. So I think it's been extremely helpful uh, as we move forward. You know, I'm excited that our, our teams have been working pretty aggressively on it. I think that there's, you know, we always wish we had more time, we always wish we had more resources. Uh, but I think if nothing else, it, it definitely speaks to the criticality of this and, and how aggressively we want to move out in the space. Uh, but move out with intent, right? I'm a firm believer as as a former medic, speed kills, right? So we don't want to go so fast that we we fall down, but we need to move aggressively. And having things like executive orders, things that can help push us in that direction, uh, are always helpful. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough in my past life to um, uh, be a part of an organization that used to brief President Obama on his daily threat on his daily intel uh, briefs, and so I, you know I had an indication of what. And, and President Obama did did, uh, did a lot for cybersecurity uh, while he was while he was in office. So I assume that would have continued with President Biden. I think the executive order is good. I just always have, since I'm not in the government sector right now or anymore, I used to be. Um, it, it's just you know you see these regulations happen all the time, executive orders uh, to to govern certain cybersecurity thing. They put these mandates out, but they really don't like. Sometimes they give some money to the people so they can go implement it and, and, and do it and adhere to the timelines, but more often than not, they don't or not enough. And so, and then they don't give them the plans and a blueprint and tell them exactly how to do it. So again, they're saying you must do all these things, but we're gonna we're not gonna help you in a way that makes it real easy for you to do and raise that bar. Now, it doesn't mean obviously that every organization's complexity. There's legacy systems in, in government, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the end of the day. Putting the just putting the executive order out there, I think people are gonna have a hard time meeting the timelines. I think they're gonna know they're they're asking the question of okay, how do I go do this now, uh, and how much is it gonna cost, and what are you gonna provide me, you know, from a funding perspective, so I can go do this and meet your timelines. I mean, I look at zero trust. I'm a huge zero trust guy. I've got it implemented at logarithm. Uh, I've been a fan of it for a long time. I just did a did a, a presentation with John Kinderback, who was like the godfather of zero trust. And we were joking that 10 years later, it became something the government has latched onto, uh, more than 10 years later. Uh, and, and so if I think about that, you know, that was 10, 12, four, almost 14 years that Zero Trust had been around, and now the government's starting to, to do it. And so I just think the timelines with the government are just going to be elongated based on all those all those reasons of why, you know, no funding, no know-how, making it hard um, as a part of that. And so I don't think, I actually think beyond the executive order, if I just look at ransomware in particular, uh, President Biden's shutdown of some of the crypto mining exchanges uh, or crypto uh, exchanges probably has a bigger influence on ransomware in particular than it does than the executive order. Uh, and just, you know, just bringing it back to the whole focus of this is, is sh shutting down and holding or holding the exchanges accountable for you know, basically, in essence, laundering money between the criminal and the victim organization, um, it, just one. They've only done it once, and I don't think that's enough to move the needle. But if they can, these organizations accountable, and you're hitting the criminal. James, I think I think we're having some. Uh, this is a, apparently a technical difficulties riddled <laughs> webinar. So uh, apologies, uh, James. I hope we didn't cut you off. Um, you know, we are. I think the slide came up. That's our cue that we are um, at the end of our time. I think just wanted to throw one final question out. And uh, Deputy Director Nataraj, and this might just go to you if if if, if James isn't here. Just what are some what are some closing thoughts? Um, we talked about a lot of different priorities and different. Um, uh, you know, uh, strategies to improve ran uh, the the resiliency against ransomware. Uh, if the attendee today could just walk away, kind of having learned one thing, what what would you like that to be, and what would you like that closing thought to to be? So I think for, for me, it comes down to the fact that we really need to look at doing four things, right? I mean, I think we need to look at within ransomware. I like to break it down and disrupting our ransomware operations. 
you know, really, as we were talking about on, on the payment schemes and a lot of those types of things, how do we take the fight to the enemy, which is less us, more love our federal partners, but really looking at two elements. How do we harden our targets? And that's an individual thing, right? How do we work within our respective elements, public and private sector, to harden ourselves to be more resilient and more secure? Then how do we raise awareness and training with a lot of our, our colleagues to be aware of phishing campaigns and those types of things? And I think that, you know, as we said, we can't expect everybody to spend every minute of their time on security, right? We have teams that are focused on that, but everybody has a part that they can play, right? I mean, to me, I jokingly tell people, like, don't click on everything, right? Like, if you, nobody's going to give me a million dollars via email. They're going to give me a million dollars and some massive check that'll show up, you know, show up to my door. So, you know, we, we need everybody to play their role in this and, and to make sure that they're doing what they can to address resilience within their, their piece of the pie. And, you know, whether it's things like, we, you know, James mentioned the, the implementation of multi-factor authentication being a huge, a huge benefit. How do we make sure that as we're doing that, people are doing their part and, you know, utilizing services that use MFA versus those that not? How do we, you know, not try to circumvent processes and those types of things. So it, at the end of the day, it's a shared responsibility. I think everybody has a role to play, public and private sector, even as individual consumers and users. We need to be cognizant of that and kind of play our role the best we can um, and to continue to collaborate because it, it needs to be that collective defense between all of us as we go forward and implement the basics. You know, passwords that aren't your, you know, password that aren't, that aren't one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you know, a lot of those basic elemental things that we keep talking about, up patching software or updating software or utilizing the right tools. You know, if we can do those things, we're going to change the landscape significantly, I think. Outstanding. And James, looks like you're, you're back. Um, the, the final question was just, uh, we're, we're at the end of time here. I wanted to get your final thoughts. If there was one uh, main takeaway for the audience, what would you like that to be? I mean, I, I think Nitin said, said it pretty well. Uh, it's not uh, ultimately, you know, as far as ransomware is concerned, it's not hard to defend against it, in my opinion. And obviously, I'm going to have people being like, oh, it's really hard. I've been a victim, et cetera. But doing the basic IT hygiene, doing the basic security hygiene, keeping your technology modern, uh, keeping your security technology modern are all just like really uh, key steps that you can do to make sure that you're not a victim or make it at least much harder for, the, for an attacker to compromise you. So I, I'll just leave it at that. It's not as hard, uh, even though there are a lot of victims that are going public. I don't think it's it's that hard to make it harder for the attackers in that scenario. And so I would just leave organizations with that of like, it is doable, whether you're a small, medium business, a large enterprise, et cetera. That's great. Great, great closing remarks. Um, so, uh, uh, Gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. This was a great discussion, very important. Uh, uh, I want to thank the attendees for joining us. Of course, I want to thank DLT, our fellow program member, for co-chairing this event. Uh, and all of you who are registered will receive an invitation for next week's briefing on Screen the Perimeter uh, with DOE, uh, West Point, and Marine Corps, among others. Uh, you can also go to icitbriefing.org to check out the full um, program. Uh, so we'll see you next time, and uh, thanks again for your time. Have a good day.